so welcome back, uh, welcome back all, and we're going to continue our first track. Yeah, and right now we have Bart, uh, who is going to tell us all about Kotlin, but not the usual way, like. The usual way Kotlin is like all this such wonderful tool and, and uh, all the things, but of course it uh, obviously have its dangerous sides and some uh, tricky sides. And I'm also a big fan <laughs> of Kotlin, as you can see. So I'm also oh, eager nice. to hear all about all about that. And uh, that's it. Uh, you can go ahead and start. Cool. All right. So uh, let me share my screen here we go all right is that coming through all right see the screens i sure our audience too do not forget to ask the questions in the question and answers area yep yeah that's uh, a great idea all right uh because i can no longer see the public chat now but uh, i guess uh, the q a will uh come in normally I don't know what happened there. And I will, uh, uh, I will, uh, in either way, uh, retranslate the questions to you at the end. Awesome, excellent. Okay, so hi everyone. I think uh, that was a pretty uh, tough nut to follow with that previous uh, talk. Some uh, really interesting insights there from uh, Carola, and great discussion afterwards. Um, so uh, welcome to the dangerous side of Kotlin. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, this is me. Yay. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Bart Enkelaar. I live in Amsterdam in the Netherlands and I work at Ball.com, which is the largest online retailer of the Netherlands and Belgium. Um, I work as a site reliability engineer there, trying to set up that way of working at Ball.com, but my background has always been um, backend engineering. Uh, so if you have any questions that we don't get to through Pine Tool, uh, or you think of them later, you can always reach out to me uh, on Twitter uh, at Bart Enkelaar. Uh, and if all else fails, you can go the old fashioned way and send me an email at uh, benkelaar at ball.com. You see there's consistency here, so that should be memorable. <laughs> um, right, so a little bit about ball.com. Uh, we're the large, as I said, we're the largest online retailer of uh, the Netherlands and Belgium. And, uh, yeah, so we have our head office in Utrecht with about 2,000 to 2,500 colleagues. It grows quickly. Uh, six or 700 of those are engineers. So uh, quite a large uh, engineering organization. Well, average large, I guess. It's not Netflix-like, but for the Netherlands, it, it's quite large. <laughs> Uh, and we sell at anything from toys to furniture to pet stuff. And, and we, we ship that from our warehouse, um, which is centrally located in the Netherlands and Belgium. And uh, we have over like 10 million active uh, uh, customers. Uh, so we, we sell 100,000 to 200,000 uh, products a day. And uh, yeah, you can imagine there's, there's quite a, an interesting microservice landscape behind all that, managing all that operation. And... Um, that's where, where we work and where we have totally embraced Kotlin as well. Because, um, uh, yeah, so it's an awesome place to work. And if you, you're you considering moving to the Netherlands to find a cool uh, engineering gig, come check us out, Bottles.com. We're a great, great place to work. Uh, right. Let's talk a bit about Alexander the Great, uh, the one from Greek, you know, Everybody knows the story about Alexander and the Gordian knots. Uh, Alexander the Great was on his triumphal uh, conquest of Asia, essentially. And uh, when in, in Persia, he got to the city of uh, Gordian, he encountered there a, a line of rulers that traced their lineage back to um, a, a farmer who had once fulfilled a prophecy by going through the gate carrying an ox cart or hauling an ox cart. And... Uh, as he pr fulfilled the prophecy, uh, the city made him king, and the current uh, lines of kings trace that lineage back to him. And what he did when he was made king is he tied that ox cart to a post in the in the center of the city with like the most intricate, sh practically practically unsolvable knot. And this this Gordian knot, uh, there, there was like this was later generations later, and there was a new prophecy that the one who would uh, loosen the Gordian knot would become ruler of all of Asia. So, well, Alexander the Great was uh, used to winning and he was on a, on a winning spree. He conquered Gordian and he, he found this prophecy. He found this knot. And uh, 
he took a look at it and he thought about it and he, he, he fiddled around with it and then he heaved his sword high above his head as you can see in this accurate photograph taken at that exact moment and he he, he sliced through the Gordian knot and that way loosened the, the cart because he realized like the prophecy doesn't say how it needs to be loosened so this will work <laughs> and in the end he, he ruled like I think half of Asia, so it was got pretty close. Um, but let's talk about Kotlin, because <laughs> uh, that's that's what we're here for, right? So, um, and as uh, uh, was already uh, mentioned in the beginning, let's not just talk about Kotlin. Let's talk about dangerous Kotlin. Uh -huh. mm. That's a dangerous fellow over there, right? <laughs> All right, but of course, what? What do I mean when I say dangerous Scotland? Because of course I don't mean like putting yourself in harm's way, running with the bulls, or or jumping from a plane, or, or like I don't know, coding on train tracks or something like that. Nothing like that. And I also don't mean like doing illegal stuff, like like dark web uh, things, hacking. You could probably do that with Scotland, but let's not. I I think. It's a better idea to not do that. So, well, let's just... that That's also not clearly <laughs> what I'm talking about. Uh, no, what I, what I mean when I say dangerous Kotlin is it's more about, about the nature of programming languages. Because as from the 60s onwards, uh, programming languages evolved, they got, like, the very initial programming languages was all about machine code and very close uh to the to the actual hardware how that works but as computers became uh broader used and and uh their programming became more necessary to solve more complex tasks the languages moved up in abstraction level and um through advances in computer science they acknowledge they they uh, grew in in functionality and in and in capability and in expressiveness and this expressiveness um and there was like a, a cycle like every couple of years a, a new language got developed and that new language uh then had some new features which made it better than the previous language and this cycle has been going on for decades now uh, and kotlin is is it's not really new anymore i, I, think, I don't I can't remember when it was announced, but uh, I think I've been using it for four years already. So uh, it's not really new, but it's definitely a lot newer than Java. And um, so what I wanted to say about what dangerous, what, what makes Kotlin dangerous, all right, sorry. The point I wanted to make here <laughs> is that newer languages get to innovate faster. So uh, as a, a language gets successful and gets um, used, get broader use, uh, they become by nature slower in innovation because they need to be more careful in, in making things like uh, uh, backwards incompatible changes. I mean, <laughs> Python, right? <laughs> and uh, Java has definitely the, suffered from this. Uh, and then that's where Kotlin came in and, and came in with all the new latest features from uh, that were developed by computer scientists and also some of the older features that Java had never implemented. And this makes it a really, really cool language to work with. But if we go back to what the purpose of a language is, if you have like some random code here and if we... I think that the primary purpose of any any programming language uh, can be expressed in like three major parts. Uh, for for one, it should fix our problem. Like that makes sense, right? Uh, but that's basically whether the language is Turing complete or not. And then the language should be easy to write. And like much more crucially because all language get all code gets read over a thousand times more than it gets written it needs to be easy to read and this this last part is where there's this interesting 
tension between rapid innovation and uh, getting it right that, for example, I think Scala completely missed the boat in because they just accepted all the features and just poured them into the language. And and in in that arena, Kotlin really has been the superhero of the JVM world because they're, they're really finding this right balance between the right feature and uh, graspability of code bases. Like, uh, for example, the, the way they, they've solved uh, Tony Hoare's, uh, well, solved, they worked around with Tony Hoare's uh, billion dollar mistake and all kinds of other awesome features that you all probably know and love, like data classes and um, operator overloads, uh, type aliases, functions as a first class citizen of the type system. Um, and things like type reification, extension methods. It's its all just features that give us much more tools as developers, give us the, the, the tools to be as expressive as we need to be. But with all these, this broad range of tools, there, there comes the comes the danger that that I really want to talk about, and that's that's it's 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 more than just like a choice dilemma that you have so many tools that you don't know which to pick. It's also the the more exotic you go with your features, the harder it will be for uh, other developers, but also for you two years down the line to understand what the intent is of the code. And since all code is is being read like thousand thousands of times more than that it's being written, making sure that it um, communicates the intent of what the code is supposed to do clearly to humans is a much harder challenge than getting the computer to do what it needs to do in like 99.9999% of the cases. It's like if you're talking computer science, like low level, then maybe not, but Usually, the hard part about software engineering is making it communicate it, its intent to humans properly. And in that context, there's a couple of features of the Kotlin um, that, that Kotlin has that I've personally, well, just made mistakes with, with that I think uh, we can all learn from. And that's, that's what this talk is all about. So... Let's talk about extension functions. I, I just highlighted them as an awesome feature of uh, of Kotlin, and I think uh, they are. Uh, before uh, uh, before I was using Kotlin, I, I loved them in Lombok, uh, which is even more hacky, I guess, than uh, uh, using Kotlin. But yeah, I, I guess yeah. I'm assuming everybody knows what these features are, but just quickly with an extension function, you can do things like add uh, methods to uh, external types, like string, which is a, a core type. You can just add an as URL uh, method, which you then can call on any string uh, to uh, turn it into a URL. Now, the problem arises that, yes, it's very powerful that you do this, but if you do this, it's usually quite hard to uh, communicate that you do this. So what often happens in larger code bases is that uh, person A writes as URL somewhere in a class and person B writes as URL somewhere else in a class and, oh, hey, now it's on a nullable uh, string. And maybe somewhere else you have a two URL that silently swallows uh, malformed URL exceptions. And so now we have three places in our code base that are scattered uh, throughout the code that all try to do sort of the same logic. And then maybe this is something that's slightly less trivial than this and there, there's a bug in it. and. You fix it in one place and it's still not fixed where you expect it to be fixed. And only then you find out that, oh, wait, this as URL is not that as URL. So, so that's a, a risk of uh, extension methods that I think should be carefully managed because the nature of methods and object is that you um, carefully uh, find a, a grouping of, of 
functions that have high cohesion. And this cohesiveness is entirely lost on extension methods. So that makes extension methods kind of a risk for properly object-oriented code. And I've even encountered a team uh, at, at, at our company that did basically this. For data classes, they would define all their uh, methods as extension methods. Uh, and I, I see that you, I understand that you can do this. And, and maybe you do this because it likes better. But coming back to that, that, that cohesion aspect of object-oriented code, that's entirely lost in here. I guess th there's a, a a tiny advantage in that you could that you can now import the method separately from the object. But if you're doing that on like um, node module style, where you usually select you can select uh, only the methods from a library that that you want, so that you have smaller uh, smaller package sizes. But if you're doing that on your object, I think if you need that on your object, you already have a cohesion uh, problem. You probably just have too many methods on your object and you need to think about refactoring your domain model as a whole. So I think this is one of those other things that you can do with extension methods, but shouldn't. So what way can you use uh, extension methods safely and well, <laughs> well, um, yeah, let's say uh, you're uh, working with uh, financial uh, information and let's say you listen to Kevin Hanley and you're smart about it and you use big decimals because you should for. <laughs> uh, but now you have big decimals as your value and you want to be able to do something like this, but you can because as IntelliJ rightly tells you, this is, you can't, multiply by a by a by an integer um, but IntelliJ is also smart say oh well you can create an extension function to do this but once again if you have a large code base and you have your big decimals everywhere as, you, as your value and you have three separate processing pipelines and seven separate developers working on this then you're gonna probably gonna be finding this method on I think <laughs> when I worked on this on this uh, project, we had this method on five separate locations, <laughs> which makes the code harder to understand because there's no guarantee that each uh, uh, location does the same thing. And it also um, makes the code harder to understand because it's just more to read. <laughs> so what you can do instead is that you define like, a wrapper class for that that describes your value, and I've called it money here. It's probably not the right right name, but you can figure that one out. And here I've used an inline class, which is another one of these reasons why Kotlin is awesome because it will then not come with uh, a memory overhead of having all these wrapper objects around. But it, it's it depends on your use case whether you can actually use in, inline classes. So. Uh, a, uh, a normal data class would, would work as well, but what you what you have if you if you do it like this is that all your code everywhere becomes more expressive, and um, all the different things that you need for this class will be cohesively, neatly packaged up together in a single location that can have documentation and is much easier to find and understand. So. Uh, that's what I wanted to say about extension functions. I think, there, oh yeah, there, there's one other way that it's like pretty much safe and good uh, to uh, use extension functions that I haven't really added in the presentation yet. And that's if it increases the, uh, the readability of your uh, local uh, logic with, uh, in a way, that is very unlikely to be uh, generalizable. You know, often you, you need to do some kind of uh, modification on an object that comes in um, and it would just read nicer to have it as a method on that object, but that transformation is only sensible within the context that you're there. Then an extension, a private extension method make, makes lots of sense. 
All right. So let's talk about operator overloading. One of these other things that I, I mentioned uh, in the beginning, uh, how awesome they are. And they are awesome. It's one of my... Um, I once, uh, when I just started out on, with Java, I uh, was discussing it with a, a friend of mine who's uh, really uh, in the academic computer science uh, scene. And he was saying, like, yeah, yeah, I, I don't have that much uh, experience with Java. But when I found out it didn't have uh, operator overloading, I was, I was really pissed. And I was just on the track to being enterprise engineers, like operator overloading, what would you need that for? But, well, recently... <laughs> I've learned how amazing it is. I mean, for this uh, example I just pulled in, this is a wonderful use of operator uh, offloading because you want to do these operations on your uh, value as easy as you would do them on uh, native, uh, on primitives. So, yay. <laughs> but where I've really made a mistake with um, operator overloading is that like over the last 10 years, I, I somehow really got into math again. I don't know if uh, others have this, but uh, with all the uh, machine learning that's going on, suddenly math was really interesting again. And the fun thing about math is that it, it gives us so much power on an abstract level is that if you think about it a lot, you run the risk of thinking about everything as math equations and, and that will work. But coming back to that, that earlier point I made, that, that code is about aligning mental models. It's about communicating intent uh, between humans much more than it is about communicating between computers. And for communication, math is usually not really the best solution. I think this is also one of the problems that many much academic code uh, suffers from. And so, so let me set the stage for you. Like uh, we were working, uh, we're an online retailer and we were, we were working on a, on a stock valuation system. So uh, what that system da did was uh, we had got shipments coming in in our warehouse all the time. And uh, those ha were, had an X amount of received goods. And that received goods were coming from some supplier. But for all kinds of reasons, it wouldn't always be apparent from which supplier which goods came. There were just goods coming in and they were packed away. And then we'd have to figure out uh, what we have paid for, for them, because what what we pay for the for the goods is of course very important in determining uh, how much we can ask our customers, which is very important for our algorithms for for our market uh, uh, judgments and stuff like that and and promotions. Uh, so we get received goods and then we figure out a price. Say these boxes, these them. 11 boxes are worth 100 euros each. And so this, this, this bunch of received goods could get a price, but then later maybe we could get new in information which could give us a better estimate about the price. Or maybe we could just actually figure out what we paid. <laughs> and, or maybe there's things like stock depreciation that, that come into play that, that could make the, the stock less valuable. So we had. Uh, an X amount of goods, and we had a, a variable price. So when it came to that total bit of stock value, you had stock transactions. So like uh, a box could be shipped to a customer, a stock a box could be uh, returned from a customer. And when we made that match, well, oh, these are the actual received goods. We could suddenly learn like, oh, only eight of these we got from this supplier and only four of these we got from that supplier. So then we'd have to split the, the bunch up. So and there were price transactions like, oh, we have an improvement on the price. We have a depreciation on the price. And so they both were, you had X stock transactions and Y price transactions. But for a bookkeeping system that just cared about stock value transactions. So what is the actual change in stock value? And we wanted to make that all traceable to all the, to the lowest level. So 
you can imagine that each stock transaction should be uh, combined with each price transaction to get the total list of stock value transactions. And I explained this while we were building it to, to several people all the time. And I, to me, I had built this, this mental model of, of this that was based on, on math. I was saying, like, yeah, it's just a cross product between stock transactions and price transactions. It makes total sense. Uh, but and and every time when I when I talk to someone, I, I took a, out a notepad and I scribbled something along the lines of this: like you just have your your delta stock and you, you have an x amount of delta stock and you have a y amount of delta p and then you get an x times y delta v. That that's the idea. And I, this I think this was my first project where I worked with Kotlin, and this was about the time it was like, oh yeah, we can do operator overloading uh, at Kotlin. It's like, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Because this is the way I explain it. So this is the way I want it in my code. So I literally wrote this stock value transactions is stock transactions times price transactions. And to me, this was the cross product that I had been talking about uh, uh, all the time. <laughs> and I was ecstatic that I could do this. I was telling her, oh yeah, Kotlin is great. Look at this awesome code. This is exactly the way I explain it. This is how code should be. But then, like, I think six months later, we were doing something else, uh, doing a, a stock returns, I think, doesn't matter. And other really good engineers joined us and they were looking at the code and it was like, I have no clue what's going on here. Because the mistake I had made was, that while I was thinking about the way I was thinking about this problem, which was X delta S times X delta P is X, Y, uh, delta V, that was not the way other people thought about this problem. So I, I maybe through my excitement about, yeah, I can finally do operator overloading. I had missed that, that uh, emphatic step of thinking about what other people read when they read this code. And if I put on that hat, there's so many things that are, are problematic with this because stock transactions was a list of stock transactions and price transaction was a, a list of uh, price transaction. And that there is no, uh, there's ambiguity in this statement. There, there is no clear definition of what this operator means. If you have, if, if this is uh, three times four in integers, then there's a strict definition of what it can can mean. Because uh, for integers, these numbers, we have a, a shared mental model of, of what that means. But stock transactions and price transactions were complex objects with, with all kinds of references to suppliers and shippers and customers. And in whole in that whole context, I. I took a, a one aspect that I was thinking about at the time and said, times is obviously about that aspect. And I ignored all those other aspects. So yeah, that was not the right way. <laughs> so so, the, so I, I guess this is where the, the risk of operator overloads is in is, yeah, they're, they're very powerful. As in, they allow you to write short code, which is also always a bit of a risk. No code should be optimized for for brevity. It should be opti uh, optimized for clearness. Um, and but this only makes sense if the operation, as expressed with those operators, is unambiguous. There's only one thing that that can mean. And if that's not the case then you probably just want a method with a descriptive name that, that removes all that ambiguity out of those operators. So that was operator overloads. Let's talk about lambdas with receivers because um, this is where I usually would do like a poll by raising hands or something like that. But <laughs> hey, it's 2020, so we're not doing that today. <laughs> But um, uh, yeah, so everybody knows what lambdas are. Uh, obviously, they're just uh, inline functions, essentially. Uh, and with a receiver is the fun thing that you bind uh, a, a 
lambda to an external object so that the disk in, within that lambda is that external object. And this for me, for me, there were alarm bells from day one with this uh, this option because it's really fun and it's it, it's quite powerful if you're doing like DSLs. Like I think that there's this this one example of an uh, HTML DSL that uh, that went around quite a lot that used these uh, lambdas with receiver quite a lot. But it's also something that does not add to the readability of your code. Rarely does it. Because uh, I wrote this, I think, a year and a half ago, something like that, maybe two. And this was uh, for a, a PopSup emulator. Well, that was running locally that because uh, we use a Google Cloud PopSup and then we have an uh, external uh, infrastructure as code solution that uh, uh, spins up our uh, our topics, our, our uh, subscriptions. It's, it's basically uh, queuing in the Google Cloud. Uh, but then for testing that locally, we run uh, uh, an emulator. And that, of course, does not have the infrastructure managed. So this is a class that just deletes all the uh, the topics and subscriptions if they're there uh, and recreates them. So if you have like remaining messages from previous run tests, that they all get cleaned up by deleting them and then it recreates them. But when you run when this runs the first time, you don't want it to fail on the topics not being there for them to delete. So I added this ignoring not found function and here in the that ignoring not not found really gets this this lambda with receiver as an argument. And and there there's an extra well weirdness going in on in that it's actually an extension method on uh, an external object that gets a lambda with receiver where the receiver is that extended method. So that's why, why admin operation can be called here, like on this. So that's like a double abstraction. And I think in this instance, because like the, the method names are, are quite descriptive, um, it works. But there's this, this whole uh, ignoring not found delete topic. So the Lambda that goes to ignoring not found has access to all the methods on the PepSub admin and that, that allows this code to work. But when you read that first line, there is no guarantee whatsoever that this Lambda with receiver is actually being called on the object that you're calling ignoring not found on. It's likely, but there's no guarantee. And this amb amb ambiguity, once again, makes that you need to jump into that and need to read what's going on here. And then you see a lambda with receiver that's being called without a receiver. So this is one of those pieces of code that I think, yeah, is smart. But uh, I think that was Aaron Gupta who once said, if I read code from me uh, and I think, oh, that's smart. I delete it immediately because smart code is hard code and hard code is unreadable code. So this we probably need to get, get rid of. I'm no longer in this team, so um, I haven't done that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like if I would be coming to this code for the first time, I, I'd have to read it, I think, five times. <laughs> So that's my issue with uh, lambdas with receiver. So now let's let, let's bring it back to this guy because uh, we're uh, reaching uh, the end of uh, my uh, allocated slot. And uh, you you may be wondering like oh, what was this Alexander the Great story all about? Because uh, it's also a bit of a missed opportunity for me because usually I talk about space flight, which is awesome. <laughs> but uh, the point I was trying to make with the Alexander the Great story is that he looked at a problem, he looked at his tools, and he went for the simplest solution. And with all these awesome new tools that Kotlin give us, gives us, I think it, it, it's really important that we don't just follow the pack and it's like, oh yeah, we want all the tools, yes, 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 yes. 
I think it's really important that we we keep critical of all features and that we stay focused on our most important tasks when we write code, and that is solving the business problems in such a way that it's sustainable, so that we write code that anyone can understand. And I think if we do that properly, then we can seal the dangerous waters that Kotlin uh, gives us with these and uh, will actually make the world a better place instead of uh, clogging it up with tech debt, which is a real danger, <laughs> as we heard in the previous talk. All right. So um, that was, uh, I think, my main talk. Uh, I finished a little early, so we may have some extra time for questions. I have uh, attributions here for some of the images I used. Uh, and uh, you can find all of the code that I, I've, well, most of the code that I've shown in this talk, some of it is from our production systems. So I will not put that on GitHub, but uh, all of the like uh, highlight code is uh, in uh, on GitHub, Bankalar slash dangerous Kotlin. Uh, the slides are also there, um, but I think they're also in Pine Tool. Maybe that's also accessible. And, uh, oh, I left these animations in, right. <laughs> Reach out to me on Twitter if you have any questions or send me an email. And I hope there's questions now. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. That was really interesting about all the things uh, in Kotlin. Uh, well, while the audience is keeping up with their thoughts, I, I hope there will arrive some questions. I can ask you uh, some of mine because uh, about this smart code uh, conce conception, uh, when it's the code just smart, you should delete it. Well, it, it's rather interesting because I, I really, I'm a big uh, fan of smart code. Like if it gets smarter, this is some different uh, features and all, oh, look at this, you can make yeah. this in one line and, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and everything works like uh, yeah. some. And it's such a high, right? Because you think about it for so long and it's like, oh, oh I can do this even more efficiently. It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, this thing exactly applies to that and uh, everything combines and it's like uh, some ho holy code <laughs> but, yeah, but eventually yeah. of course you you have to think about all the people who will read it uh, later and uh, yeah. obviously Kotlin is a new language and we can't really know how these features uh, will be treated in a five or ten year later yeah. right yeah, uh, exactly. And the, even the latest uh, release of Kotlin 1.4, uh, as I understood, was mainly focused on optimizing and uh, a little bit tidying up the code base, the standard library, naming conventions, and so on. Well, wasn't wasn't 1.4 all about the trailing comma? <laughs> Maybe, yeah, trailing <laughs> comma, finally. I waited for this so long. <laughs> <laughs> Why it wasn't from the beginning, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, eventually all these methods, like uh, these conventions uh, with uh, on all or indexed um, on the collections, uh, all the things will eventually really make the code uh, cleaner and uh, e more easier to read, I hope. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yep. <laughs> so uh I, I think our our audience is uh quite smart <laughs> understood <laughs> all of all of uh the information that you well, gave so, heads up that's a risk i, I have some uh, smart bonus for just in case if there were no questions we can go into that if you want but i also see that we're running at at zero so maybe uh, almost uh, yeah what, what, what do you have uh, yeah so uh <laughs> this this is uh let's see uh i need to focus right i guess hold on here we go all right so mm -hmm. um talking about uh, extension methods and uh, lump that with receiver when I, when i was diving into all of that i uh i this is probably harder to read so what you see here is is a method that uh gets an instance and a lambda with receiver that applies on that uh on that type mm -hmm. and 
to me, if you have a, a lambda with receiver and a type, it should be obvious to get a uh, partially applied version of that. That is a lambda without receiver with that instance already tied to that lambda. So the the next two lines were the, the two things ways that would seem intuitive to me. Like the top one is the way that works. But intuitively, mm -hmm. I would think you could do like instance dot function with receiver, and then you'd get a function that is uh, bound to the instance that is just from U to V here. So we started. Uh, uh, so for me, this is mm -hmm. kind of like a missing feature in Kotlin. Uh, but then I started, started to discussing it uh, with colleagues, and, and one of them said, uh, "Isn't this like currying?" And um, mm -hmm. then I said, "Well, it's." Kind of like currying, but actually it's partial application, which you can get from currying. So then I started thinking, and then I got to to these uh, functions, which is like, <laughs> yeah, okay. But but he was saying you can't do currying in Kotlin, and I was like, of course you can do cur currying in Kotlin. Kotlin is awesome; you can do everything with him. Uh -huh. like, like if you do this, you can do well. So this is partial currying. This is currying for two arguments and for yeah. three arguments. Uh, but if you do this, then indeed you can do. In that original function, you curry your uh, your lambda with receiver, and then you can uh, partially apply the instance to that lambda, and then you have your function from U to V. So indeed, it was currying. But mm -hmm. so coming back to what my talks about, and that's why this is like a bonus round because uh, I think there's some pretty smart code in here, but it's mostly extremely abstract code. This is like just computer science essentially. So. This is fun, uh, yep. <laughs> but I don't want to see this in my production code when I'm waking up at 2, 2 a.m. and trying to debug uh, a problem. If, if I just like, there's nothing about my domain model here. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, this is uh, indeed uh, a little bit complicated. I would, uh, it, it would take for me some quite quite some time to understand what it what it's doing uh, without your comments that it's uh, eventually carrying the functions. But <laughs> yeah. it, it's it's a really fun that Kotlin can do this Definitely. eventually. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, yeah, and uh, but once again, and well, maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe uh, fun is a code smell of danger. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> so you're, you're telling us that code shouldn't be fun. It, it, it should be boring. <laughs> well, yeah, boring is easy. And easy is better to understand. Uh, all right. And we uh, really have one question that I hey. just now. Yeah, <laughs> we, we, can, we can discuss it. Are other safeguards into the type system that language designers can use to avoid bad usages like the last one, especially in functional languages. Um, um, I, I think the last one was uh, with the Lambda, uh, with the receiver. This one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, th I think so, yeah. So uh, are there any safeguards that uh, language designers can use to avoid bad usages uh, like this? Like maybe some yeah. Pointers. So I'm 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 thinking about this, and when you when you go into uh, uh, type grammars, it's um, there's there's probably things you can do, but uh, <laughs> and I I think I, I I read a paper on something like this recently, but I I, I can't remember it clearly mm. enough to uh, go to a, a clear recommendation. But indeed, um, this is exactly where uh, languages can shine and where I, I think uh, Kotlin did it so much better than Scala did is uh, get making finding that balance between power and responsibility. Uh, so, of course, you can't have it everywhere. And, and that's why I, I highlighted the Lambdas with receiver. I, I think that's one of those features that might shift kind of too much to the power side. Um, and yeah, maybe uh, in the type system, like for example, I haven't recently thought about how this would interact with sealed classes, for example. Because uh, if you have um, an object as a PubSub admin, then maybe you can guarantee. Yeah, then, then of course you can guarantee that the receiver is uh, that single object. So you, so you remove one of the uh, one of the the main uh, uh, 
ambiguities Mi- from this code. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or, or also, as we can, as we know, uh, Kotlin is uh, developed by uh, JetBrains, the same company that uh, creates uh, IntelliJ IDEA. So maybe it one. would be not uh, <laughs> the language feature, but the IDEA feature. Uh, yeah. Just to highlight that probably you yeah. didn't want to invoke that. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, we have one more question. Why should we switch to Kotlin from Java? <laughs> the general question <laughs> with any uh, Kotlin talk. <laughs> Okay. So, okay. Um, yeah, the 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 several best reasons uh, for you. Why uh, would you say we should? Speak? Did you see the first part of this talk? Where, where was it? Where was it? Uh, right. Yeah. This this slide. I think. All yep. this is why you should switch from Kotlin to, to Java. But of course, Java is innovating as well. I mean, with records coming in in uh, in uh, 15 and uh, finally multi-line strings, hey. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. Uh, I, I, ever since uh, Java uh, switched to uh, the, the half-year uh, release rhythm, uh, they've uh, made uh, much better uh, improvements. And I mean, the JVM is still a really awesome virtual machine. The, the things it does with just-in-time compil- compilation are for long-list systems really, really uh, useful. Um, now, of course, <laughs> with the cloud, things usually don't live that long anymore, but it, it's still, uh, JVM is, is extremely valuable. And just because of that value, I think Java is also still valuable. But I guess that was not the question. You should switch to Kotlin because it's more fun and it's easier to read and it gives you more pools, tools to be expressive. Yeah, if <laughs> if you don't believe that it's fun, just look at its uh, keyword for the function. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You have operator fun, private fun, all kinds of fun. <laughs> yeah, all kinds of fun. Right. Uh, so thank you very much for this uh, talk. It was great. And uh, we are going to... Uh, to introduce our next uh, speaker. Uh, cool. It will be Monica, uh, our Java champion, uh, who will tell us everything we wanted to, to know about G1GC. So stay tuned on this track. And thank you, Bart. Bye. Welcome, and thanks a lot, too. It was uh, really awesome talking here. Bye. Yeah, it, 